Good evening and welcome to our program tonight. I'm Jen Maxey, Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, and I hope we have some new friends, we are a cultural center and a museum in Los Angeles. We are committed to welcoming the stranger based on the Jewish tradition of welcoming the stranger and deeply committed to the American democratic ideals of equality and freedom. We present programs and exhibitions across all disciplines of the arts, and they are meant to tell stories, stories that we hope provoke empathy and conversation and ultimately help to create a more just society. The Skirball is very honored to be working for the third time with Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn as we launch an online exhibition of their most recent work, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope. And we are grateful to the philanthropic people and organizations that support the Skirball ever more so these times. And tonight I would like to acknowledge those people who made donations to support the Tightrope exhibition and related programs. So we are very grateful to Rebecca and Howard Farber, the Ford Foundation, the Conrad and Hilton Foundation, the Karsh Family Foundation, and U.S. Bank. So thank you. Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun are the first husband and wife team to share a Pulitzer Prize. They have traveled and reported from all over the world, helping readers to see the challenges facing women and people living in poverty in many different countries. They regularly return and are tonight uh, in Nick's hometown of Yamhill, Oregon, where in 2017 it became apparent to them that the dire conditions facing people in developing nations also existed in their own backyard. So they applied their journalistic eyes to try to understand how Americans cope with drug addiction, incarceration, homelessness, and the lack of affordable health care. The result was the much acclaimed book, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope, which was first published in January of 2020. And as they traveled across America researching the book, they were accompanied by award-winning photographer Lindsay Adario, whose images illustrate the stories in the book and whose photography is now presented for the first time to the public as a virtual exhibition on the Skirball's website. So following this evening's program, if you haven't already, I do encourage you to vis visit the virtual exhibition and we will drop the link in the chat for you later. So to get this conversation started, we have invited Eric Liu, President and CEO of Seattle-based Citizen University, an organization which fosters civic engagement across America. Eric served in the Clinton administration and heads up the Aspen Institute's program on citizenship and American identity. He has long been a friend and mentor to the Skirball staff, and it is our pleasure to welcome him to the conversation this evening. So Eric, take it away. Jen, uh, thank you so much. And um, I am so grateful to be uh, here with you all this evening. And uh, for those of you who are newcomers to the Skirball, I hope this begins a deep, deep engagement with one of America's great institutions. Um, Jen alluded to the fact that uh, um, the kind of twin strands of DNA of uh, Jewish values and the American creed um, inform, well, they inform Jack Skirball, whose name uh, endows the institution, but um, they inform every bit of the programming that the Skirball does. And um, in our work at Citizen University, we've been uh, blessed to get to uh, collaborate and partner with um, the entire team at the Skirball. And um, I am so delighted uh, tonight to uh, get to engage in conversation with uh, Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun, and I'll invite them to uh, actually join uh, and turn on their video. Great. Hello, uh, Nick and Cheryl. Hi. Uh, Hi there. So great to be with you tonight. And uh, what we're going to do for our uh, everyone watching is um, we're going to have a conversation here for about uh, uh, 25, 30 minutes or so, and then um, um, we'll um, open it up to questions. And as we're going, uh, we invite all of you to put questions into the Q&A function uh, at the bottom here of the Zoom tab. Um, and as we go, um, I'll try to keep an eye on those, but the, certainly once we get to that segment, um, I'll try to curate a few of those questions to draw out um, um, further insight from uh, Cheryl and Nick. And uh, um, I guess what I wanted to do is just to begin with, um, Jen gave us an overview of the book and the impetus for the book, um, and you're joining us tonight from the very place that you largely chronicle in the book, uh, Nick, your hometown of Yam Hill, Oregon. And uh, you know, when this book came out in January of 2020, um, well, in every sense that hardly needs to be belabored, it was a different world. It was a different time um, pre-pandemic. And we were chatting before um, the show started here 
uh, just about what things in, um, in the story that you tell in this book. The subtitle of Tightrope is Americans Reaching for Hope. Um, and what makes the hope part of the book very powerful is that it is a book just completely saturated also with heartbreak um, and pain and brokenness. And, um, and it's in spite of that that you are um, telling stories of hope. And, uh, and I'm wondering now, a, a year later, a changed country and planet later uh, because of the pandemic, um, what is the mix of heartbreak and hope that you're um, picking up on now just back in Yam Hill um, and, uh, and share that with us? Um, well, first of all, great to, great to be with you. Uh, greetings, Jim Hill. It snowed this afternoon, so um, we, um, for those who are in Southern California, we send a gust of uh, cool, snowy air uh, toward you. Um, you know, Eric, I guess I'd say that since Tightrope, both the heartbreak and the hope have been magnified. On the heartbreak side, we... Um, when we were writing it, we wrote as one illustration of the collapse of the working class in America and here that a quarter of the kids on my old school bus, the number six school bus, were dead of uh, drugs, alcohol, or suicide, uh, what are called deaths of despair. But I was just, you know, doing them. Since we did that calculation, I know of four more kids on the bus who have died. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a third or more uh, now. Who have perished and the things that we tended to write about you know unemployment well there are 10 million more people who were unemployed in america than there were a year ago uh social isolation obviously much more devastating today um and yet there's also i and and you know talk about a, a health system that is inadequate uh i think those fissures and those inadequacies are more evident to everybody but i also think that there's more hope and I think that's partly because that heartbreak is more evident to everybody in the country. And just as it was the Great Depression that helped lead to the New Deal and to addressing longstanding problems, I think that there is a chance that, and you see it, I, I mean, I think it's part of the Biden strategy to try to take advantage of uh, this COVID crisis and deal with long-standing inequities in America that haven't been addressed adequately. And uh, so, you know, in the in his 1.9 trillion stimulus plan, I mean, the the thing that maybe excites me the most is there is the most important plan to address child poverty that America has seen in at least 50 years, maybe ever, and um, that would have a profound impact. On the country and so it just it generally feels to me that there is now some real read of hope that we can make progress on some of these deep inequities in america if we seize this opportunity and push for it cheryl i'm wondering for you i mean um uh, you are woven into the fabric also of this community and the storytelling that you both do in this book um you know, in a deep sense, you, you both do the thing that you also prescribe in the book, which is to take these vast scale problems and the consequences of these problems um, and bring them to human scale and humanize people, right? Um, and so even the phrase deaths of despair, which has come into common parlance, uh, at least in, um, you know, intellectual discourse, um, is a phrase that can lump a lot of people, a lot of lives and a lot of complicatedness um, you know, together. And, and Cheryl, for you, um, being attuned to that, but also not being from uh, Yam Hill, um, what shaped you most in the making of this book? What, how did it impact you? Because I'm sure it would have to be different from the way things landed with, uh, with Nick. Well, well, Eric, first of all, it's, it's great to be here uh, talking with you, and I'm really uh, appreciative for, for the uh, Skirbo uh, Museum and having the exhibit. Um, what really surprised me is that, you know, we were covering as foreign correspondents for the times we were covering humanitarian crises uh, in the developing world, uh, whether it was Southeast Asia for me or China, parts of China, uh, you know, we even went to North Korea. Um, you know, we saw, okay, these are developing, there's definitely gonna be poverty, there's definitely gonna be humanitarian crises. What we hadn't expected is, is that when we came back home every year, 
uh, to Yamhill. We would come back every year for vacation and we would meet with a lot of, uh, you know, people who work on the farm, who are, you know, people who were, you know, former friends of Nick's and I would get to know them. Um, you know, we would have everyday conversations about whether it was around work or the farm, but over time we started asking a, a little bit more probing questions uh, and we discovered that their households, their uh, relationships at home, uh, the challenges that they were facing were every bit as um, in a crisis and dysfunctional uh, you know, as what we saw overseas. I mean, there was a humanitarian crisis unfolding, you know, here in our own backyard. We actually really did, uh, you know, look at, it, you know, with a, a correspondent's eyes because, I mean, I wouldn't say foreign, but in some ways it was foreign to us. We hadn't anticipated it. Um, you know, here in the rolling hills of, of Oregon, you expect everyone to be happy. Uh, um, absolutely not. Um, they may have a piece of land that they have, you know, a, a, a manufactured home uh, that they inherited from, you know, their parents, thank goodness. But other than that, it's, it's they don't have a job. Uh, and there are a lot of concrete problems that uh, really, um, you know, made us more aware of the challenges they face. And also programs that we talked about during the campaign. So for instance, um, UBI, Universal Basic Income. It really gave us insight actually seeing these people and what they faced, why we are not sure that UBI is actually a good thing, at least you know, for on a long-term basis. Maybe as a short-term subsidy, it's fine. But what we discovered is the importance of jobs, not just for the income that they bring in, but also for a sense of purpose and a sense of identity. Because one thing that we discovered uh, is that when people here lost their jobs, they lost you know, their sense of, of, of who they were. Uh, and that led to self-medication, to greater addiction, uh, the whole you know, downward spiral. You know, one of the things, there, there's so many things that you both have said already that I wanna tease out. Um, I wanna start with this. Um, you know, Nick, you alluded a moment ago to the Great Depression as a, in a sense a precedent for the scale of crisis that, um, uh, that we're in right now and, and potentially inviting the scale of response. One of the phrases that really hit me hard in this book that you used um, and kind of late in the book was um, that places like Yamhill and other places all around the United States, by the way, this is not a story only about this piece of Oregon, um, are experiencing what you called a social Great Depression, um, a, an absolute collapse in social trust, a collapse in webs of relationship, obligation, mutuality, a collapse in that sense, Cheryl, that you're describing of individual purpose and shared purpose, right? And that um, when those things collapse, it's as devastating in many ways, you know, more devastating for a community than when, um, when the Dow collapses, right? Uh, um, when, uh, when big uh, Wall Street banks uh, uh, crater and, and, and default on loans. And, and so I guess I wanna to speak to this dimension of things that's, you could, depending on how you look at it, it's either adjacent to policy or in, in our work, we think of this as kind of upstream of policy, right? The kind of the, 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 the social context within which policy is happening. What are the things that this experience uh, and, and, and that the book itself talks about um, that you think can remedy this social Great Depression to re-infuse a sense of connectedness, purpose? Um, and again, obviously uh, the, the pandemic makes everything harder and worse, but uh, even fast forward, X number of months when we're past the worst of the pandemic, what would you want to see to begin to address this social Great Depression? You know, I think people tend to be skeptical when we use terms like that. And so um, let me just preemptively address that. You know, at one level, economically, this is not parallel to the Great Depression. On the other hand, even before COVID and the job related losses, um, life expectancy in the US had fallen for three years in a row for the first time since. Uh, 19, since the Spanish flu uh, influenza epidemic of, uh, of 1918. And even in the Great Depression, that did not happen. And that's essentially because of uh, record levels of suicides, of overdoses, uh, of, of alcohol-related deaths. And we wondered sometimes why, I mean, we argue in Tightrope that many of these deaths were related to job losses. And we wondered why it was that in places like Yamhill, all around the country, job losses in the Great Depression did not lead to those same kind of manifestations. And I think it was 
And this will resonate to somebody who, like yourself, who really, who knits together, stitches together social fabric. It was that at that time, there was a social fabric and there were institutions, community institutions that functioned. And these days in places like Amhill, those have largely gone away and um, drugs in particular, I think really eroded social capital. Um, and one thing that struck me very much, I've written a lot about sexual violence all around the world. Um, there were two boys on my old number six bus who both were uh, sent to prison for raping very young girls. And it was sort of hard for me to come to terms with that. I mean, how, you know, these two boys who I knew, one was one of my closest neighbors, you know, how does that happen? And I think it was because the social fabric here really became unglued. And yet, if, you know, some of the people watching, if they've heard of Yam Hill, they probably heard of it because we make some great wines here. And the local economy, in many ways, is actually quite robust because of some terrific wineries, mostly started by Californians who moved here. And in many ways, that's kind of a metaphor for the national economy. The, you know, you have elements of the national economy that are very robust that have led to great wealth, and that you also have a working class that has been dysfunctional and that is really disintegrated. And so, you know, I think that's, you know, how do we repair it? I think it's stitching together the social fabric, which I think has to start with kids. It has to start with wrestling with addiction, um, with family support, and uh, and with education and jobs. Cheryl, did you want to add anything on that? On that? Uh, well, I mean, I think that in many ways, what this pandemic has done is exposed these stark contrasts even more so, and also the need uh, for some mediation, uh, some bridging. So for instance, we know that essential workers, like I'm not an essential worker, I can stay at home and I can do work from home. Whereas someone who's a grocery clerk or who's working as a teller in a bank, or you know, who's you know, working in a hospital as an, even a janitor, they are essential workers and um, they need to be taken care of because it's going to affect how I live as well as you know, the people who are in the upper class and have more freedom uh, you know, to maneuver, uh, they still need to you know, use the bank. And so they, they do need to rely on these essential workers. And so it's you know, in our interest to make sure that those essential workers are not continuing to spread a, a virus. We want them to be vaccinated. We want them to be, you know, get their health care and get you know paid sick leave. I think now people understand why paid sick leave is so mm -hmm. important. And these things didn't happen before the pandemic. So I think that's uh, you know what the pandemic hopefully has done is exposed people uh, to the downside risks of not really uh, you know caring enough about uh, social cohesion, about you know integration of, of people in society and a fully functioning society. You know, I I um just thinking about those people on the number six bus, Nick and. You know, you open the book with stories of the members of one of those families, the Knapp family, and um, that ends up, even in the chronicling that you do here, um, experiencing so much death and um, social destruction, and um, and uh, and there's a resilient matriarch uh, in that family, I suppose you could think of that, and um, and and one of the things that is that I had to guard against as I was reading it is. Careful! Don't fall into the trap of thinking an individual resilient, you know, matriarch. Uh, this person with grit is going to be the solution to stuff, right? You talk in this book about how there's this overarching, the water we swim in as Americans is a water of hyper individualism and rugged individualism, right? Um, and that's persistence, that's grit, that's you know, yeah, there's terrible stuff happening, but I'm going to just keep pulling myself up by the bootstraps, and um, and that's why at the end of this book, after all these stories of Heartbreak and hope. You you have a section here that is about some of the things, Cheryl, that you're talking about. That are systemic um, reforms, policy uh, changes, whether it is investment in early childhood education, or um, you know, a monthly child allowance, or you know, a focus on uh, actually jobs, on 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 just mass scale creation of jobs and the rest. Um, the the thing that underlies this, um, particularly for a place like Yamhill, um, is these vast global tectonic shifts that have displaced 
um, many people's opportunities, right, um, in the economy. Um, and um, our participants in the audience may not know this, uh, but Cheryl, in addition to being uh, the, the the first Asian American to win the Pulitzer Prize uh, as a journalist is also um, uh, a capitalist, a someone who works in banking and understands um, that world of markets and uh, and new markets and creating um, both financing and capital and economic opportunity in communities that um, often don't have easy access to it. And uh, Cheryl, I just kind of want to ask you from your vantage point because we were talking also again earlier about how it's not an accident given what has gone on in this country the last decade and a half, that so many young people today are drawn not to capitalism, but to socialism, right? Uh, because capitalism seems broken. Capitalism seems to be right. using all of these Yamhill stories. Um, how Do you think that in the kind of menu of things that we should be thinking about to repair all this destruction, we should be thinking about either abandoning capitalism or a different kind of uh, capitalism altogether? Well, so I was talking to some students earlier today and uh, the, it, the topic of whether it should be socialism or capitalism came up and they were very, very, um, you know, eager to hear about socialism. And I was explaining that, you know, I don't think that socialism is the answer. Uh, and I think really it's a matter of what kind of capitalism do we want? Uh, and that capital, capitalism, uh, there is unfettered capitalism. We have seen that in parts of China, it is terrible. I mean, it means that there are no rules. And so people who are selling powdered medicine can really be selling you poison. And you know, that has happened in China. Uh, in, you know, we have had uh, you know, different cycles of capitalism. You know, from 1945 to 1975, we had more or less a more inclusive capitalism because you know, everyone actually did better uh, than in the past. And so uh, you know, you had, you know, CEOs making a lot more money, but so were the workers making a lot more money. And the gaps were narrower between uh, the racial gaps uh, and the economic gaps were narrower than they had been in a long time. That changed as uh, we had different policies uh, in the mid 1970s. So we had, you know, power taken away from labor unions and given more to companies. You know, we had a lot of deregulation, uh, you know, at the time, it probably really was the antidote that was needed because uh, the economy had become had become very staid and you know you know clunky and overburdened. Uh, but now we've overshot. We've gone too far. Uh, we need to actually uh, you know change things up. And you know cap capitalism uh, is really a living and breathing you know thing, uh, and it really needs to evolve it does change and we need to change with the times. And so it needs guardrails. And I think that we need to come up with more appropriate guardrails to make capitalism work for everyone to for more people than it is currently working for. You know, I, I'm, Nick, I wanna pick up on that and the idea, <clears throat> you know, implicit in the idea of um, whether a more inclusive capitalism or something like, you know, uh, social democracy or, you know, uh, democratic socialism for that matter, um, Implicit in, in that conversation are issues of class. Um, and viewed one way, tightrope is a look at the ways in which Americans who generally don't like to admit class or talk about class or pretend that they're you know, stuck in place. Americans like to worship at the altar of kind of perpetual mobility. Um, this is a book about ways in which that, that, ha that stopped being the reality a long time ago, right? And this is a book in many ways about what's broken about class. Um, but there's an interwoven layer that Cheryl just alluded to as well, which of course is race. Um, and uh, parts of the book that are not in Yamhill, you know, in Baltimore and other parts of the country, um, you look with equal uh, rigor and vigor at people who are contending not just with the same class dynamics and the ways that inequality has gotten so exacerbated in our lifetimes, uh, but the ways in which a perpetual um, set of systems that uh, um, uh, crush people on the basis of color um, have also uh, persisted. I'm curious when you kind of tell folks about what it means to reach for hope, um, uh, how you answer that question, um, if you were to kind of silence the class part of your answer and think about only the race part of it, um, what gives you hope right now that it is possible, in fact, um, for this country to reckon with um, the divides uh, that are the legacy uh, of white supremacy? And what do you think um, uh, is possible in bringing everybody together to do that. 
so um, on that front, I think we are clearly um, making progress, albeit too slow. And the fact that you know this week we have a the first African American vice president is uh, you know some test the first female uh, is to some degree some testimony to that to that slow progress. The um, the economic race gaps have also uh, declined. The class gaps have increased. And the I think one useful way of thinking about those race gaps and class gaps, uh, Brian Stevenson uh, uh, once told me, uh, one way of thinking of it is, um, you know, that uh, each is a, uh, a kind of cancer. And, you know, of course, African-Americans are disproportionately also at the uh, at the bottom of the class gap. And, you know, for them, it's sort of two kind, dealing with two kinds of cancer at once. And I think there's some reality to that. Here in Yam Hill, um, the population is overwhelmingly white. And there, um, I mean, I remember, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, when uh, African Americans in inner city America were going through problems, there was, uh, you know, virtually no sympathy and a lot of sort of finger pointing and people go talking about uh, deadbeat dads and people making bad choices and uh, showing no personal responsibility. And um, meanwhile, there was a great uh, Harvard sociologist, William Julius Wilson, who said, no, it's, it's about jobs being lost. And he was exactly right, because when jobs left lowly white Yam Hill and when they left West Virginia, and when they left Northern Maine, the same kind of pathologies unfolded. And essentially what we've seen in Yam Hill is what we saw in African-American communities uh, a generation earlier. And, um, you know, Bobby Kennedy, one of his legacies, which I think isn't fully appreciated, is he worked very, very hard to try to stitch together the uh, white and black working classes in this country. And he was assassinated before he could make headway on that. Um, Whereas today there's a real political divide. And while the white and black uh, working classes both tend to be socially conservative, um, they, the, the black working class tends to vote Democratic, the white working class tends to vote uh, in many cases Republican. And I think one of the challenges for the Biden administration will be whether it can try to make some progress on Bobby Kennedy's dream of uh, providing some unity across the race dynamic within the working class. One of the things that um, one of our kind of watchword phrases in our work at, at Citizen University um, is the, a line from Ella Baker, the great civil rights uh, activist who labored often in the shadow of Dr. Martin Luther King um, and observed how that movement for change, like many movements for change, will gravitate around uh, a single great leader, um, often a single great male leader, um, and her kind of trenchant, but deeply wise observation was that a strong people don't need strong leaders. Um, and the fact is that right now in the United States, left, right, white, black, Asian, um, the people are gravitating to strong leaders or people who are gonna promise um, one way or another that they will solve the problem. Um, sometimes they're presidents, sometimes they're uh, other figures. Um, but the, you know, what you both describe in this book is the ways in which our own you know, Brian Stevens speaks of these ills as cancers, the body politic has weakened, right? And we are a weakened people right now uh, in these ways. And, you know, your, your point, Nick, about how 30 years ago, the kinds of narratives that were used about um, inner city uh, young black men mainly um, are narratives that could be taken almost word for word um, and used in stereotypes against um, Appalachian, uh, poor white people, opioid addicted, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and it leads me to this other theme that runs throughout your book, which is a theme not only of responsibility and narratives of responsibility, but the theme of empathy, right? Because the great political question, not just for Joe Biden, but frankly, for you all as neighbors and friends of people in Yamhill and me in Seattle and King County and anybody who's watching wherever you are is um, how can we, on paper, in theory, the white working class um, should have a kind of an epiphany of empathy right now. Oh, shoot, all those things that we used to be saying about inner city black folks, we're living them, we're experiencing them. We feel their pain and we ought to lock arms with them, right? But of course, what happens far too often, preyed on by 
um, demagogic leaders is that they're like, no, let's blame uh, them. Let's at least push them down further so that we feel like we're still not the bottom rung of the ladder, right? And um, that is itself a, a, the result of this deep, deep lack of empathy. And so you two in writing this book have given a masterclass in many things journalistic, but one is a masterclass in empathy. Uh, you quote Brian Stevenson, and folks don't know Brian Stevenson of Equal Justice Initiative, he talks about proximity all the time. You were so proximate to the people you're describing. How do you recommend for all of us to cultivate these skills of empathy that can allow you to see the way in which these narratives were mirror images of each other and to humanize each other when we don't have journalistic credentials, when we're not gonna spend deep time like this, how can everyday folks build that same muscle of empathy that can lead us to the better path of realization rather than the kind of um, one that wants you to kind of smoosh down the shame? Well, first of all, I think that um, the lack of empathy really uh, you know, happens when you think of the other person as an other thing, as a thing, not as a person. Uh, you know, they've done studies that show that, you know, really, you know, um, you know, homeless people are not people, they're things. Uh, and so it's really important to, uh, you know, first of all, recognize that, you know, they are not things, they're people. Um, but also, I think, um, you know, as you, you raise the whole issue of proximity, it's more basically meeting people. You don't have to go very far often, uh, you know. You know, if you're in a city, you just have to go to, you know, take a crosstown bus or, or you take a, a subway and you can, uh, you know, be at a homeless shelter or you can, uh, you know, be at a food pantry and you can meet these people. And I think that it's, it's, you know, very easy, actually, if you make the effort to learn a little bit more about, you know, some of these other people. But the empathy is also uh, not just important for its own sake. It's also important to lead you to action. I mean, if you have empathy for a particular, uh, you know, uh, type of, you know, for instance, the people who are un not educated because their parents are addicted to drugs and they can't even pay attention to whether their kids are actually in school or not. You know, it's leading, it's the empathy for that kind of kid that leads to action to help bring that kid back into school, which is really important or, or being part of a nonprofit or helping a nonprofit, whether it's to finance a non nonprofit or give donations to a nonprofit that will help that kid, you know, get back in school. I mean, I think that's what's really important. And, you know, to just reaching out a little bit more to build bridges to people of, you know, whether it's a different political affiliation or, you know, a different, you know, uh, class or racial divide. I mean, you know, we've all had the situation where you count how many people of color do you have in your network, um, you know, um, uh, you know, I probably have a little bit more. <laughs> you, you and I, Eric, probably have a little bit more. Um, but you know, um, you know, but you know, in general, I think that the educated have a little bit, uh, you know, less than someone, you know, uh, in the working class, and that also shows in the way we do charitable giving. One of the interesting things that we discovered is that uh, people in the uh, lower income levels, they actually give more as a percentage of their income to charity than people at the top. And it isn't that people at the top are less charitable, they're very charitable, but they don't see the need around them. Whereas people you know, in the working class, they walk in their neighborhoods and they see the need and they just pull it out of their pocket and they, they give, even though they can't deduct uh, you know, on their taxes because they don't make enough to claim the deduction. So, uh, you know, I think people have to see me more. I, I want to ask one more question here and then um, uh, start bringing in some of the uh, questions that have been accumulating in the Q&A function and just remind folks who are participants here to please post your questions in the Q&A uh, box. Um, the, the, the question that I want to pose is about power, um, which both of you have mentioned in passing and you talk about in the book, it's sort of you know, the background reality here. Um, and uh, so much of, I guess, when you get to, when you, to bridge from the stories that you tell to the solutions that you offer um, toward the end of the book um, requires you to gain or have some basic literacy in power. Do I know how to advocate for a policy? Do I know who to mobilize um, to tell different stories uh, in the media about people like me? Do I know, um, you know who makes decisions um, on, uh, on policy and whatever it might be. And 
I'm wondering just again, to bring it back to human scale, in Yam Hill, do you feel like the crises that we've been going through, even the crisis of the pandemic, the way it's exacerbated thing, has spurred people to, be, to basically say, I need to figure out a little bit more about who decides stuff and how I should get involved in stuff and how I can change things. Um, do you think it has kind of created more demand for an understanding of and a practice of um, local civic power? You know, Eric, I, I wish I could say that it was leading to more civic literacy. Um, in fact, I think of my, um, my old friend, Mary, who we write about in the book, who was my seventh grade crush, um, and then had <clears throat> all kinds of uh, troubles, uh, domestic violence, she abused alcohol and drugs, she was homeless for seven years, and um, and then she, she has overcome her addictions and she's, uh, she's doing great. And, uh, I, I asked her, um, you know, whether she'd ever, uh, voted and she said, well, in the past, she never, she never felt that voting really mattered. She hadn't been interested, but then in 2016, she voted for the first time in her life for Donald Trump because she heard him speaking to her, to people like her. And I think that that has been the pattern of a lot of the, the white working class folks we've, uh, who are in the book, who felt that um, Trump spoke to them, who felt that Trump blamed the people that they would like to blame for their troubles, and who presented them with a narrative that was reassuring that people were cheating uh, them and they could, and he would fix it. He would he would bring back those manufacturing jobs, et cetera. And um, so, you know, <laughs> so I think that he got some people more engaged in political life and to some degree feeling empowered, um, but empowered in a really sad way and engaged in a really sad way. And um, there have been narratives around here about Antifa um, when there were forest fires last summer in Oregon, then the narrative was that Antifa were setting the fires and that people, you know, and not in Yam Hill, but in some other towns where rumors would start that the Antifa were going to arrive on buses and bust up the towns. People would carry their guns to downtown to defend their town from these, you know, Antifa. And then when the Antifa didn't show up, they'd say, oh, well, it worked. Uh, we fended them off. And I just found, find this just, just horrendously sad um, because instead of you know, building some kind of a common sense of where we are, a common reality to begin to address some of these problems, I think the result has been conspiracy theories and uh, kind of a delusion. Um, and you know, I, it was kind of magnified just uh, recently uh, some friends um, asked me, you know, if they were going to get in trouble because they were pro-Trump. And I think that's because this narrative has been going around in some right-wing quarters that, uh, you know, liberals like myself are going to go after them and round them up and put them in, in uh, re-education camps. And, you know, I, I was telling my friends, you know, nobody's going to come after you. You're, you're perfectly safe. But their fear just reflected the dysfunction of political life in so much of the United States. And so much of, of civilian life now takes place online. So, you know, mm. the public square is on Facebook and it's not in the real square. And the problem with that is you can actually, you know, go into your own silos on, you know, online. Whereas in the public square, you go to the square and you see anybody who happens to be in that square. Now you create your own siloed squares. And that's what, uh, creates even more divisiveness. Uh, and, um, you know, so I think that that's, we, we still don't have the physical civ uh, civilian institutions that we really need. Places like Skirbel that actually can be, you know, a, a more sort of open, you know, flexible um, uh, forum uh, for discussion and debate that are safe places for debate. Um, that is a great segue to uh, uh, the theme of a few questions that have accumulated in the Q&A uh, box here. 
Um, the first two actually were really about some of what you both just spoke to, which is the depth of the division in our country, right? And we, we, you've diagnosed some deep problems here. You've set out some possible solutions, some of which the current administration um, either is or is going to uh, try to take up uh, um, in proposals and legislation. Um, but the, you know, forget about the divisions of the Senate uh, right now, but just the American public itself, you've just painted a picture of people living in alternating realities, put it to, you know, to put it nicely, um, alternate realities that um, are not intersecting. Um, you know, we were talking, Cheryl, beforehand just about facts and, fa you know, uh, you know and, and President Obama has spoken of this moment as an, you know, as an epistemological crisis where if you don't have the same facts, your ability to actually solve problems uh, gets shrunk down pretty close to zero. And, um, and I guess one of the things that, you know, your emphasis on proximity, meeting people, engaging people, um, does force you to confront a different set of facts. And that goes in every direction, right? Folks in Yam Hill um, can and should um, be connected to people um, living in central Seattle right now and, you know, and getting a different point of view. But I guess the question is, what are ways that we can do that beyond the individual scale? Um, are you a believer, for instance, in national service uh, yeah. as a way to kind of accelerate that and amplify that at scale? And, and what other things do you think can do to actually, from the bottom up, break us out of those epistemological silos? So I was just going to mention national service. And um, I, I would avoid making it mandatory just because I think that creates a lot of resistance. And you know, so let's first start with, uh, with you know, some sort of volunteer programs. And I think there are a couple of big benefits to that. And one is to mix people up. And so, um, you know, it's not just that it will take folks from Yamhill and take them and, you know, have them encounter folks in Seattle, but it'll also take liberals in Seattle and send them off to Kansas farm towns. And uh, that will be good for everybody and it'll help them understand the country. And um, I guess in addition, it strikes me that in places like Yam Hill that were really struggling, essentially every institution has failed them except for the US military. And the US military has really been the only uh, escalator up uh, for these communities. And the same has been true on Native American reservations across the country. Every other American institution has failed Native Americans dismally. And yet the military has um, provided real opportunity for, for many. And, um, and that's why it is you know, revered in some, in, in, some, uh, in some communities. And the one problem today is that according to the military, a majority of 18 year olds actually don't qualify to join the, uh, the US military, either because they uh, don't have a high school diploma or because they can't pass a drug test, or because they can't pass the physical fitness test, or because they have a felony conviction. Um, and it's those who most need that escalator that don't have access to it. And um, so, um, you know, I mean, from my point of view in Yam Hill, military has done much more good in the social escalator function than it has in protecting the country. I mean, it's been profoundly important as a social escalator, as a training force. Um, and um, so I think, you know, national service can um, imperfectly, uh, to some degree, provide some of those, um, some of those, uh, some of that role instead, you know, in much the same way that um, the, uh, the, the mission experience has for the Mormon community. And in ways that have, you know, hugely benefited uh, the LDS community, and uh, and later, you know, Utah, when many people return with languages, with experience, et cetera. And so, some kind of national or international service, I think, would be a great way to help knit the country together, and um, and also provide people with a way to escape their communities. But I think it has to be really embraced and made cool because. You know, if it's more like medicine, then people just won't go. I mean, in, in the way that Teach for America became really hot and, and cool, a cool thing for, you know, young university graduates to go into, uh, and now it's become much more regularized, which is terrific. Um, you know, but I do think that, you know, national service has to be something that is, you know, very attractive 
uh, and that there might be a path out of, uh, you know, when you exit national service, that it would be something that people, that companies or, or that institutions mm -hmm. or the government want to see people do, that they'll, it'll make those candidates more attractive because you need the pull factor rather than the push factor. And I also think that a national service, you know, to the degree that it can have elements that are in the military. Uh, I mean, the military really should be protecting the country. It shouldn't be there just as a social escalator. I mean, you know, unfortunately it happens to be a great social escalator, but that's not the original purpose. Um, but national service in this, similarly, you know, you know, it shouldn't be just as a social escalator, but it, you know, for it to be succeed, uh, for it to have some of the same elements and components that the military has, uh, which would make it successful. Um, I want to pick up on a, a couple of other threads in the, these uh, questions and, and weave them together. There's mention of Isabel Wilkerson's recent work about caste. There's uh, questions about the meaning of white working class and the, how we're even defining it. And, um, and it leads me to think, I mean, I've been hearing increasingly over the last couple of years and certainly, um, you know, during the last election season, um, if I see one more journalistic profile of white working class Trump voters in a diner, you know, I'm going to I'm going to fill in the blank. Right. Uh, flip out. Um, and uh, and often those complaints are voiced by people who may be working class if you define that as um, household income. Um, but they're certainly not white um, and they feel like they're part of the narrative and they're part of aspiration um, has been obscured by this overemphasis on um, how to get back white working class uh, Trump voters. And um, I just, I, I'm curious to hear you speak about this because obviously you tell a story that's more complicated than that. And you're like, actually going to those diners is pretty darn useful and humanizing if you, if you grew up with the people <laughs> at those diners. Uh, uh, but um, what do you say to that um, kind sure. of objection that we've overemphasized in our national discourse, uh, th this dimension? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I'm unsympathetic to the diner. It's become a, <laughs> kind of a cliche that people pop into a diner. So, um, 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 you know, it's like a foreign correspondent interviewing a taxi driver. <laughs> yeah. um, but look, um, in terms of definitions, uh, the probably the best way to define working class is somebody who does not have a college education. It's uh, just high school or or less. And of course, in one way, that's ridiculous that, you know, that includes Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates as working class. Um, but in general, class in America is more about education than it is about, uh, about anything else. And um, in terms of why it matters, um, you know, I think it's sort of unfortunate that among the university educated, it has become, um, I think somewhat fashionable to be condescending to uh, to working class uh, voters, and I think that's one reason that they have, in many ways, rebelled and um, and ended up uh, voting for Republicans. That they they feel that condescension, and uh, at one level, I'd say one important reason to pay attention is uh, that that's where there are a lot of votes uh, are. You know, there were about eight million voters who had voted for Barack Obama in 2012 and then voted for uh, Donald Trump in 2016. And those 8 million voters are, you know, they were critical and it was some sliver of them that then returned and voted for Biden uh, next time around. And obviously, you know, everything is overdetermined. So it's also more African-American voters and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but uh, working class voters, I think, are pivotal. And I think that one of the things we learned in this election, too, is that um, this class divide also risks uh, Democratic voters in terms of Latino voters, for example. Um, and there are even some hints of that with some African-American working class voters who on um, you know, on social issues, on immigration, on law and order, they may be uh, somewhat less sympathetic to democratic elites um, than, than Democrats would like to think. Um, um, and so as a matter of winning presidential elections, but also in winning the Senate for that matter, um, you know, getting things done, I think that 
this is a constituency that traditionally was uh, was democratic. These were uh, Roosevelt Democrats who then became Reagan Republicans. And I think the Democrats have a pretty good story to to make the case to them that uh, you know these are folks who want the uh, minimum wage to be raised. Uh, they want a bandwidth for all programs. They want child care for all programs. Uh, they want many things that Biden is pushing. On the other hand, they tend to be pro-gun. They uh, tend to be uh, in, in many cases, uh, uh, more hostile to abortion. I mean, there, you know, there's a divide there, but I think Democrats can do a lot better with that constituency than, um, than they have. And, and I guess just the other element of it is, you know, when you've got um, so many people suffering so deeply, uh, whether black, brown, or white, then, uh, you know, the country can't, you know, when talks about empathy again, um, there are more people dying every two weeks from drugs, alcohol, and suicide uh, than died in the entire 19 year history of the Afghan and Iraq wars. And when that's happening, and when, you know, there's so many kids who were growing up in dysfunctional homes, then surely it's appropriate to feel some empathy and want to understand where they're coming from. I think that's really important. It also, I think, is important to understand that it's only really been 12 years that we've seen this drastic change. If you look at Obama in 2008 and you look at the counties he won, I mean, it was, it was really modeled. It was, you know, he had pockets all over the country. It wasn't just the coastal uh, you know, ranges, which is what Biden had. So there has been a, a huge change, a huge shift in 12 years, which suggests that there could be still more shifts in the next 12 years. We just don't know. Uh, but I, I also think that, um, as Nick said, the Democrats have become a little bit more elite, the elite urban class, certainly here in Yamhill, that's how they are perceived. Mm -hmm. That even though Trump went to an Ivy League institution, went to a boarding school for high school, I mean, really born with a silver spoon. Because of the way he speaks, his language, and I think language is really important. Um, the way he speaks really is much more like a working class guy. And same with Joe Biden. You know, I think, you know, because he has a little bit of a stutter or he, you know, he deals with this stutter and he has, you know, um, malappropriates, um, Propiisms, you know, every now and then. I think that sort of, you know, makes them a little bit more authentic. Whereas, you, whereas you look at all of the other candidates, they're perfectly articulate, you know, full paragraph sentences, and that's just not the way the average working class American, certainly the white American, speaks. And so they wanted some. They want someone who speaks like them. So I think that's, um, you know, that has become a factor. People want, uh, you know, evidence. That they're that that the candidate is going to be empathetic, you know, to them, and one way they can see that is just by the way they speak to the people. I, I guess I want to um, bring us to a close by inviting you each just to spend a moment um, um, emphasizing the hope side of the equation. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's here. If you, many of the people in the Q and A have said they have read the book. Some have said they haven't yet. Uh, if you haven't yet, um, uh, read it and sit with it. Um, there, there, there is a, uh, it, it seeps in um, and, and the way that you all uh, bring us into proximity um, with the people whose lives you've shared here um, is very moving. Um, uh, and I think, um, again, in reading it in these times um, <laughs> makes it all the more difficult to actually sustain hope right now. Um, because everyone is feeling isolated and everyone is feeling cut off from possibility. And so I want to invite you in the last moments here to each say, like literally right now, in this work that you're doing as you're talking about this book, as you're doing your other parts of your day jobs, what is giving you hope and what should we be um, holding on to or getting involved in to give ourselves uh, greater hope in civic life? Well, I do hope that, and I, and I do think uh, that the, the pandemic has exposed a lot of these. Uh, you know, the grim reality of the inequities uh, of the, you know, the, the failings of, of society right now um, in education, in healthcare, uh, in um, 
you know, certainly in our political uh, engagement and, and disparity of views. Um, and I think that gives us an opportunity. So in Chinese, we have this thing called Weiji, you know, uh, it's a crisis, but a crisis, there is danger, but there's also opportunity. And I think that's what we have now. Yes, we have a huge amount of danger. If we don't do anything, if we fail, but there's a huge opportunity. It's in the same way that, you know, Biden is trying not to waste a crisis, uh, use the crisis to bring about the kind of changes that FDR did, you know, with the New Deal. So his uh, program on child poverty to try and, you know, cut that in half, which is, you know, arguably the, you know, the biggest plan uh, that the U.S. has seen. And it is achievable. Uh, people think, oh, gosh, that's impossible. But the U.K. actually achieved, um, you know, uh, that similar feat. They actually cut child poverty in half in seven years. So we can achieve it. Homelessness. So, you know, under Obama, uh, they decided they were so embarrassed that there was, uh, that veterans were homeless. And so they said, we're going to eradicate veteran homelessness. And in four years, they cut it in half. So these are really intractable problems. Uh, and so in Tightrope, what we try and do is outline some of the programs that people have come up with, devised, and actually doing randomized controlled trials to actually address some of these problems, whether it's homelessness, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's you know, moving people from spending five years in jail to actually you know, go into a drug treatment program, which would really help them <laughs> and, and have them emerge at the, at the end of two years uh, with a more productive job than if they were sitting in a jail. So we have a lot of opportunity uh, to bring about change if you know, a, a Biden's plans can be implemented. Yeah, I, I, I actually really genuinely do feel uh, a fair amount of hope, Eric. You don't have to, you know, I don't have to like pluck it from some deep reserve. <laughs> and part of that is, uh, relates to what Cheryl uh, said that, you know, we, um, in terms of dealing with these deep structural problems in the country, we have the toolbox, we know what to do. There's, you know, there are plenty of evidence-based uh, solutions. We have the resources as a country. Um, what we lack, I think, is the political will. And I, it seems to me that that political will has already been emerging over time. I tend to think of American history um, moving in cycles. Arthur Sajner talked about cycles in American history. And I think that, that's, um, that you see that. And it seems to me that since about the mid-1970s, we were moving in the wrong way uh, in uh, racializing social programs, uh, in stigmatizing them, in coming up with a narrative in which it's all about pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It's all about personal responsibility. And I think that that was already maybe, and, and, and uh, cutting taxes and social services. Um, and I think that was actually already changing. And I wonder if when historians look back, they will think about Kansas as the turning point. And you may remember Governor Sam Brownback cutting taxes so deeply in Kansas that schools were gutted. And um, then Kansas Republicans rebelled <laughs> and said, tax us more. And, uh, and they did. They you know, raised taxes to rescue the schools. They elected a Democratic governor. Um, uh, meanwhile, you had states like Texas lead the way to, to go to, to return from mass incarceration, to cut incarceration. You had Idaho um, and Utah uh, expand Medicaid. Um, and um, I think that part of, the, part of what has changed, frankly, is that so many folks in the white working class have been struggling that it's harder to come up with racial racialized narratives about how investing in social services will just help the other. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look, that's a double standard, it's hypocritical, but if it belatedly leads to greater empathy that can help people of all races finally get some compassion and better policies, then we'll be a better country for it. And, um, so it seems to me that things are coming together. And now we have Joe Biden, who I think speaks a narrative of dignity, um, who is inspired by Roosevelt. And I guess I just, let me leave you with a story that I think would resonate with people in Yamhill uh, that Biden tells about his dad. Um, 
Um, his dad was struggling working for a car dealership. Um, the At a Christmas party, the owner of the car dealership um, threw down some silver dollars for the his employees to scramble on the floor for. And Biden's dad was so repulsed by that that he took his wife and they walked out. And I think there are an awful lot of Americans who feel like they're scrambling on the floor for coins like that and who feel that they've lost their dignity, lost uh, that self-esteem, and for whom that kind of story, that kind of vocabulary uh, actually means something and perhaps can be an engine toward a better narrative and toward better policies. Well, Nick Kristoff, Cheryl Wudun, um, in your work uh, throughout your careers and particularly in this book, uh, Tightrope, um, you really unspool a, a narrative of collective responsibility that can be a deep antidote to um, this dominant uh, storyline of individualism and individual responsibility in the United States. And um, it's a really powerful, uh, not only document you've created, but example you have set. Um, and uh, before I turn it over back to Jen to uh, close out our program, I, I just want to point people in chat, the link was posted to the virtual uh, exhibit at the Skirball um, of photographs and narrative um, drawn from the communities chronicled in Tightrope. And we totally encourage you to um, explore those virtually. And then um, soon enough, one day, we hope to uh, uh, do it in person at the Skirball if, if you can. But uh, um, uh, Nick, Cheryl, thank you so much. Um, been great to converse with you. And uh, Jan, let me toss it back to you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Thank you, Eric, so much. Uh, if we were live, we would all be, uh, the, you would hear a lot of applause right now, but we'll all just clap in our living rooms. Um, Nick and Cheryl, thank you so much for all of your hard work and uh, the many, many years we've collaborated with you both. And Eric, you, uh, for people at home, Eric's organization is Citizen University. Do take a look at Citizen University, doing incredible work always. Um, so many, you, you, the three of you reminded me of, of uh, you, you gave me hope um, because of, of the hard work that you're always doing. You know, we're just never done. Um, so I do want to also let the audience at home know that on March 14th, Cheryl will be back um, in conversation with Lindsay Adario, the award-winning photojournalist whose photos are in this exhibition. So we're happy about that. That conversation, come to our website, skirball.org, and you'll see information about that. And, um, you know, we're always doing other talks and other programs, so please just check in with us. We very, very much look forward to the day when it is safe enough to welcome you all back through our doors. And until that time, we wish you all good health. Thank you so much. Good night.